This is Support is Sexy, episode 267, with author, columnist, and astrologer, Rebecca Gordon. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm happy to have you here. And you know, it just would not be the same without you. And today I'm so excited about our guest, astrologer, columnist, author, Rebecca Gordon. Rebecca has appeared on the Dr. Oz show. She's also the horoscope columnist for Harper's Bazaar. But what I love about Rebecca, many things, but that she really reminds us in this episode, the importance of tapping into our curiosity and allowing that to really guide us. And actually, in this episode, she was kind enough to do a short reading for me. Thank you, Rebecca. So you will hear a little bit about me. And I learned a lot about myself through this reading based on my birthday and some other information that she uses to gather information about who we are, what we're drawn to natural parts of us as a person based on our astrology. So in this episode, though, the part about curiosity, it really is important to let it guide us. And Rebecca talks about her own experience with that and how it's important for all of us to be tuned in to that. And it was a reminder for me to stay tuned into that and who I naturally am. So for you, if you are in a place where you feel stuck or you may want to make a move and not be sure which way you want to go, I think this will be a great episode for you and a reminder, again, to tap into or allow yourself just to experience being curious and being open and remembering the things that you may have loved since childhood or that you loved and you let go of, but that you're interested in again. So it's really important to pay attention to that. Make sure you listen out for that. Also on this episode, what you'll learn from Rebecca is conversation about how to avoid burnout and overwhelm, especially as an entrepreneur. We're all born for a reason. Also very important, why you must have an answer when someone asks you the question, what do you want? She also talks about what most of us often misunderstand about astrology, what astrology and our business charts can tell us about ourselves as women entrepreneurs. And as I mentioned, she gives me the reading of life in this episode. So you'll hear a little bit about her process, how she works, and you'll learn a little bit about me. All right. So thank you so much for listening. I know you're going to enjoy this. So without further ado, Rebecca Gordon. So Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. I am as well, Elaine. Thanks for having me on your show. Of course. Thank you. So our first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Hmm. Uh, that's interesting because I could say this kind of like in two different parts. I think, first of all, I've always had the mindset of an entrepreneur. Um, like whenever I was growing up, I had an idea. I was very quick to say, let's make it happen. And bringing people together. I was starting community groups and clubs from an early age. So, um, and then I can, I can remember um, when I was like around 14 and 15, I, I became very much involved in the DIY punk rock culture. And that taught me a lot really about community. That was a huge influence. Um, and honestly, I was really young. I was about 15 where I started just kind of having ideas to create a magazine, to bringing people together and realizing how you can make change individually. That was huge. Um, I met my first community through the idea of starting a little zine and it got really big pretty fast. And that um, I remember the publishing day that made me really excited. Um, So after that, I sort of just like had the fire in me to do more Mm -hmm. and to create more. Um, so I kept on writing and bringing people together from activists and artists on um, really creating communities. And so the power of community was really clear to me early on and what we could do alone versus together. So after that, I, I probably, you know, I went to college and afterwards I had a some, some semi-regular job in the art world. But meanwhile, I was studying astrology all through high school and college and Probably I was hmm, 24 
years mm-hmm. old when I quit my day job because it was it was just a day where it became uh, unacceptable. It was sort of like I cannot do this anymore. I'm done completely, no longer. And I I left that very quickly to go full time into astrology, and and that was like immediately I just fell in love with figuring out everything. But it was hard. I mean. I'm not going to lie, like figuring out the back end, or the, the front end and how to create events. I mean, but I loved it all. I loved just, it was almost like going to college all over again, figuring out everything by experiencing it. Um, so I enjoyed every aspect of being an entrepreneur because you're always learning. I mean, to this day, I'm still a student and I'm still learning so much as, you know, technology is changing so fast these days. So it keeps us on our toes, right? Exactly. I don't think there's ever a point. I don't know for anybody. I don't care how how big or successful or whatever it looks like for you. You are always learning as an entrepreneur. There's always something. Exactly. I mean, and the technology was so different, you know, like 13 years ago when I began. It's so being an entrepreneur then is a completely different world than somebody learning to be an entrepreneur now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think some things for sure stay the same. Right. Uh, that, you know, I, I always think we need to, as entrepreneurs, uh, know what we need for ourselves and know how to nourish ourselves sometimes before we nourish our company. And so many entrepreneurs get lost in that balance. Guilty. Uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> me too. Haven't we all been through that? Like burnout, overwhelm? Yes. Yeah, I always say I hit a wall and then I say, I say, oh, I need to slow down for a second or stop or give myself a break. But I want to do that before I smash into the wall. Oh, that's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm totally guilty of doing the other two, but we live and learn, right? Exactly. Like, you know, we figure it out as we go and then we can help other people who are coming up. Right. Self-care takes practice. Like everything, mm-hmm. so, like everything else. Now you grew up in New York, right? You're a native New Yorker like me. I am. It's so good to meet another one. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm always excited to meet another New Yorker because we're such a rare breed now, you know, <laughs> exactly. like in this city. I'm actually like fifth generation New Yorker. I've been like, my family's been here forever. I don't even know. They came here from Belarus, you know, mm-hmm. and they first came to upstate New York and Hudson and then four generations ago, they moved from Hudson to, to New York City. So yeah, I was I was born here in the city. We call it the city, the you know, city, so, exactly. right, like it's the only city. Um, though, basically, uh, my father's an anthropologist. So I grew up traveling, though, like we had a home base in New York City. But since he's an anthropologist, he was always getting sabbatical. So I lived in Africa, like West Africa, I lived in South America, Dominican Republic, Europe, we lived all over the world. And I went to international schools. So my my upbringing was very different from most people I knew, you know, um, especially later on in college, like I couldn't relate to anybody later about what I had been what I had seen. And um, yeah, it's an amazing experience, but experience, but it's one that obviously not a lot of kids experience. So you can't talk about it really with anyone. Yeah, it's it's odd. I, I totally kept quiet about it. Like when mm-hmm. I got to later in high school, it was just I knew that nobody could relate. Like I, my high school class was like five people in it, one from my whole graduating class in Africa, you know, wow. uh, right? One person was from Iran or somebody from China and et cetera. So and anyway, I mean, the um, so I got to see a lot of different cultures early on. It taught me about change. Mm-hmm. It taught me about flexibility and movement. Uh, I think that, you know, eventually after a lot of travel, they wanted me to stay in one place for high school. We ended up in South Carolina, out of all places, which was quite a stark difference from Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, but the one thing, and I, I look back on this whole uh, history of growing up and everything, and I see like I was wherever I was, I was pretty obsessed with the sky. So I can remember as somewhat of a link weaving throughout all of the cities and countries. Like I, my thing was okay, check out the stars at night. Like that was always there. That was my main thing. After dinner, go outside, look at the stars. Some things always would stay the same. So I can see how. That also happened. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, 
it was a very unusual growing up. And my father was uh, very, he was sort of like the opposite of helicopter parent, you know, who's mm, kind of just gave you like a lot of freedom, a lot of freedom. Yeah. And really he kind of, he supported me in what I wanted to do, but he, he let me really fall and make mistakes and figure things out. And back to your previous question, I think that also taught me a lot of about entrepreneurship because, mm -hmm. you know, how to, how to do things, how to do basic things and everything. He just kind of, when we would be in Africa and I couldn't speak Fulani or French at the moment and I had to learn how to like buy bread and figure out things and get around. So it's just like really great at letting me go out in the world and figure things out. I mean, that was a total gift looking back. Mm -hmm. Now you started studying astrology when you were about 14, right? With your mom? Exactly. I did. How did, yes. how did you, um, how did that begin? I know you mentioned about being intrigued by the sky. How did it uh, evolve into studying astrology? Yeah, um, let's see. So I think that probably since I can remember, since the age of literally, I'm going to say like four or five years old, I was obsessed with astronomy and planets. And I would just everywhere I could collect like planets and star stickers. And then as long as I was able to speak, I was asking for books on astronomy, mm -hmm. like stars and planets. So I had like every kid's astronomy book that I could find whenever I go to the library, like take them out. And, you know, there was a lot, actually. So I didn't know about astrology for the longest time. And probably from just being a kid, looking at stars, um, fast forward to the age of 14. I don't know about you. But when I was 14, I was getting into all this witchy stuff, like I was going to tarot cards and I Ching and everything. I was just totally getting absorbed by uh, the fact that there is another reality that we are not seeing. And like, this is not all there is. In mm. fact, the fact that this is all there is would just make me so nauseous. Right. <laughs> uh, I couldn't even take it. There has so, to be more than this. There has to be more than this. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted, so I was just getting absorbed in books. And I even remember picking up this book called Wheels of Light by Anodia Judith when I was like 14. <laughs> I was so young to pick that up. And I just carried it around everywhere with me, like my Bible. And it was just a book about the chakras, but it also talked about so many other things. So I was getting absorbed in the metaphysical world. Uh, at that time, it was sort of, I was 14, reading all these metaphysical books and learning about the archetypes, Carl Jung. I remember clearly getting asked to babysit across the street from me. And I was like, great, I need money. You know, I, I'll totally do this job. Well, the woman who I, the woman's house just happened to have all of these astrology books. And one of them was Linda Goodman's Love Signs. I don't know if you know that book. No, I'm going to write it like, down though. <laughs> it's a classic 70s astrology book. Oh, wait, I think actually I do. I think I have it. I think a friend gave it to do. me as a gift. Yes, years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's fantastic. It's really poetic, but it's sort of one of those classics. So it was covered in dust on her shelf and everything. And I just got immersed. I started reading that while the kids went to sleep. I read almost any of everything I could get my hands on in her house. So this seemed to put together two worlds for me. Like the sky I had been looking at since I was a child, my interest in psychology uh, the planet and the fact that these two things have anything to do with each other. And this also connected me to that there we are all born for a reason. And what is it's all about finding what that is, that there are larger forces working in the universe, um, without having to label it as any specific religion. And this gave me a feeling of meaning, and also just absolute wonder. So basically, she got home that night, and I was like, "Wait, we have to talk." <laughs> you know, kind of <laughs> what like is this magical yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> like we have to talk about these books I just found, and so we stayed up late that night. I asked her a thousand questions, and I think I just asked her to teach me. By the end of it, I mm -hmm. was just like, "Now was so she enthralled. an astrologer too, or just interested in uh, astronomy?" Oh, she was. 
oh no, she was a professional astrologer and I didn't know this at the mm, time. All I just, right? She lived across the street from me mm -hmm. and about a block to the left. And um, absolutely, she agreed to teach me. So I studied with her once a week uh, after my babysitting job at her house. We would study astrology together weekly. So that became a ritual I did once a week all through high school. Uh, and I think that was the beginning of a mentorship and a, a, long, a lifelong relationship. Also, this is a woman who married my dad. So as you mentioned, she also became my stepmother too. So, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. So wait, so at that time, obviously she wasn't, but then did they meet later or start at, how did that, tell us the exactly. story. Exactly. <laughs> well, that might be a bit of a digression. <laughs> no. It's fascinating. <laughs> but it's it. true, right? So, right, I think they got to know through, they got to know each other through the fact that I was babysitting the, there all right. the time. Um, exactly. So that's how it all happened. And then, you know, of course, we got to talk more when she became my stepmother. And we would have conversations more like, the moon is in Leo today. What should we do with that energy? And okay, the moon is in Virgo and really like syncing up our lives to lunar cycles. So it became part of the daily conversation mm -hmm. in my house. Wow. Uh, it was kind of like woven into what's the weather, you know? Right. And it uh, felt, I'm sure it felt just natural. Yeah. It wasn't like anything at all occult or strange. Right. It was very much woven into the fabric of the day. And it seemed yeah, absolutely natural, as you said. So then when you went to, you were you in uh, South Carolina at this time? I was, yes. Okay. So when you went to college, where did you study and, and what did you study? Did you know then that astrology was still going to be something that was going to be, I should say, something that you went into professionally? Or no, you said you had another kind of job, right? Right. So, you know, after that amazing high school mentorship program with my stepmother, <laughs> I was sort of like, it was really hard to like leave that and say, okay, I'm going to leave and go to college and uh, study something. Um, what I had been doing up to that point was I just been obsessed with art and painting and sculpture. So I had created, I had all of this art and sculpture that, you know, everybody in my high school was like, whoa, you're going to be an artist, go to art school, go to art school. So everybody was telling me, you know, I'm, I should go to art school because I was sort of just couldn't stop making all of this art. And um, that was, that was my thing. Um, as well as astrology. And I didn't know that you could go to school for astrology mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, I, if I had known, I would have done that. There wasn't really a school for astrology too, though. It's not like you could say, hey, I'm going to study astrology in college. Um, we, don't, we didn't really have that accessible. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I built a school in New York, why I created that here. Um, but anyways, back to, back to the point, I... I did go to art school, but throughout the entire time I was in art school, all I was doing in my spare time was astrology charts of all my classmates and my family and my friends, uh, who has, who's ever chart, who's ever birth info I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. I would do their chart. Mm -hmm. So it was, for <laughs> it was fun. Like it wasn't like you were doing it as a side hustle. It was just your obsession. Oh, no, I didn't feel like I was ready to charge at all. And that wasn't even in my consciousness right. that this could be a business. Mm -hmm. I just loved it so much. It's, I fell asleep with astrology books next to my, next to me. I woke up with them next to me. They were on my coffee table. You know, it was just part of, part of life. And, um, I did charts of all my roommates through college. We studied together. I got everybody into it. Of course, that was in my circle, you know? Um, and then, by the end of uh, college, I just wanted all I, I just wanted to get immersed in astrology again. But instead, I still didn't think that was an option. So, you know, of course, I got a job in the art world and so on. So what did, what tell us about that day then when you got to the point where you said, this is it, I'm going to focus on astrology full time? What was the <laughs> catalyst for that moment? Or was it a build up to that moment? Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> so good question. Um, so, yeah, my first job was um, in the art world, and then I also worked as a stylist a bit, too. I think in that 
time, it was just easier to be somewhat fluid with professions. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was doing all of that kind of artistic work as well as styling. Um, And in all of the breaks, all of the vacations, I would make sure I went to astrology conferences. So anytime there was a break from work, I could, you know, I would get a little vacation time. I would just head off to the nearest astrology conference. Um, And that was still my life. Um, I can, I can remember clearly one conference in the year 2004. I believe it was in Chicago in this hotel that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, really strange because it wasn't really built for a conference. You couldn't find anything. It was so artistic that it was very hard to get to our lectures. And I remember clearly in this conference, I was pretty lost trying to find my 9 a.m. lecture. And this woman was also lost. And we were trying to like pay for our coffees and get to the lecture. I don't know what happened. She literally, she looked at me. And she was like, you're from New York, right? And I said, yes. She's like, me too. And um, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like going to the lecture and, you know, on the eighth house or whatever. And uh, she just looked at me. She says, I want to I want to work with you. I want to talk to you. I think we're going to be good friends. And it was like very immediate. I looked at her and I knew that like I knew my name, that I was going to know her. But it was all happened in a second. Hmm. Um, and that was Susan Miller from astrology zone right and she became my first mentor but it was yeah it was such a moment and late and she asked me later on that day at the conference she said to me um so so what do you want to do so what are you doing here basically I was the only 24 year old at this conference where everybody was like at least twice my age I was the youngest person yeah did did you know who she was at that time or just you just had that connection I think I was starting to understand. I had heard her name, but I was just starting to get to know who she was. Yes, mm-hmm. I was just starting to. I didn't know. I was. Yeah, I was just learning about her. Um, and then so she asked you, what did you want to do? Did you have your answer yet? Did you know at that time? Oh, I had no idea, and that she really took me by surprise because basically, I think I gave her this glazed-over look, like. I don't know because at the t- I said, well, I'm working in the art, well, I'm working in a gallery, and I just started telling her about what I was doing, but I didn't tell her what I wanted to do, and she just kept looking at me, and then she was like, well, um, she's like, you work in the art world, so you're a painter, would you like to paint my calendar? I'm going to paint a calendar, and quickly I was like, no, <laughs> so she's like, okay, then you don't want to be an artist. So she, quickly she was there to kind of ascertain. All right, so let's figure this out. She was like, what if I was here, she said this to me, to help you and to give you what what you wanted, whatever you need. What if I was here to help you? She's like, you need to have an answer. When somebody Mm -hmm. asks you what you want to do, she was like, you need to know what you want and say it. She's like, think about that. And she left. It was like this sort of... (laughs) I'm going to leave you with that. (laughs) Yeah, it was... It was like something came from the heavens to talk to me. And I was like, huh, yeah, you're right. I got it. You know, I was 24 years old. And that night I went back to my hotel room. I thought about it. And I considered that, well, you know, the last uh, probably 10 years of my life, I've been living and breathing and eating astrology. And this is what I love. I'm so passionate about every day. It hadn't even occurred to me that it could be a career and it's something I want to do. I just thought it would be something that I love, you know. And um, I started to kind of move the needle slowly that night as I went to bed. Like, wow, what if like all these people at this conference are astrologers? And then it just occurred to me, I'm the only one here that's not, you Mm -hmm. know, like this is a profession. All of these lights just went off in my head that night. And I couldn't wait to talk to her the next day and tell her I had figured it out. And I was very ambivalent about saying it, but I remember... Um, seeing her the next day and her asking me so did you think about it and everything and I remember saying something along the lines of um, with a bit of apprehension like yeah you know maybe astrology (laughs) (laughs) I was so shy because I didn't even know that this could even be possible you know Uh, that's amazing that's an go ahead well she just looked at me and she and she said yes 
She's like, meet me tomorrow at Effie's Cafe on the Upper East Side. We were all flying back that night. We met the next day. Wow. And, and the rest is history. So the we started working together. That's I mean, that was, yeah, after that, I, I left, uh, I started working with her for, and in, in three months into working with her um, in the world of astrology, and I was literally answering questions, like astrological questions people would write in, in their reader mail mm-hmm. um, to start off with. And um, after three months of that, I pretty much quit my day job. And it was just like it, at that point, it was just unacceptable, in my opinion, to go on working the the other the other work in the gallery where, um, when I had when this, which was really just kind of holding my attention and so magnetic every day, I couldn't even bear to do the other anymore. So, it happened so quickly. I'd say yeah, three months after that that conference. Wow, that's a great story. I think um, so many wonderful things about it, but a couple of things that really jumped out at me were. Uh, the fact that sometimes all it takes is someone asking you the right question, even if they don't give you the answer. But the fact that she asked you the question and said you need to go figure out this answer was such a pivotal moment. It seems from what you told us uh, was such a pivotal moment for you at that point. It just seems so powerful. That's a really great way to look at it in, in the questions we ask. It's not necessarily the answers we give somebody, but yeah, right. It was all of the probing nature of that question was exactly what I needed at that time. Um, yeah, and true. I, I think, um, too, the other part of it is just this reminder. And I have to I tell myself this and I've done episodes where I've mentioned this when people ask me usually either, you know, at these wonderful women I talk to at the end of the episode, they might say, so what do you need or how can I help you? Or what are you looking for? And in the beginning, I didn't have answers. I just be, oh, well, just, you know, just sort of sometimes you don't, I should speak for myself. Sometimes I don't even get clear. I'm just working or doing whatever and moving along and not really clear on what do I really want? So I make it a point to have answers in that moment when people ask that question and what for women to think about it as our listeners, the, the answer might change over time, but have an answer, which I think she was saying to you. So important. Exactly. Yeah, that was a huge lesson. And and just knowing yourself and at least throwing some light out there of where you may like to go. Exactly. What do you think people misunderstand about astrology? <laughs> so many things. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess the most basic level is that the sun sign horoscopes is all there is. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people think that they read their horoscope and they say, oh, how can one sign speak to everybody under that sign? And they think that it's sort of bogus. A lot of people read the horoscopes and they think that it's cheap or fake and not real. Um, Now, I just want to mention along the lines of that, um, first of all, we are more than our sun sign, obviously. The sun is just, it's one part of the whole chart. Um, Sun sign horoscopes are work and that's why they've been in existence for so long because you can read for an entire sign and general information that will apply to everybody under that sign uh sun sign horoscopes originated in the 30s when people needed hope Mm. during the depression and and they did the job and still to this day they give people a sense of hope and hopefully optimism about the future Really, it's just like the weather, you know, here's the weather, it's raining, maybe you want to wear an umbrella, Mm. take an umbrella out with you. Uh, So I think a big misconception is sunshine horoscopes, which I like to call the PR department of astrology. Mm -hmm. Um, Because really, that's the gateway drug for so many of us. The entry point for a lot of people. Totally. And after that, we might get a book after reading the horoscopes religiously for a while. Uh... So the other thing, I mean, I've written sun sign horoscopes since since I was like 26, I think, and I love writing horoscopes. I mean, there's it it really it involves a lot of geometry research just to make a very simple prediction. They take a long time to write. We don't just write what's up in the top of our head for every sign. We're looking at angles and patterns to write a simple two sentences. It can take so much research and math. Um, I think that's a big misconception. And and also, I guess the fact that 
there, you know, we have entire charts and everything has a chart, not just people, businesses have a chart, animals have a chart, countries have a chart um, as well. Let's talk about the business chart since you just mentioned that was going to be one of my next questions. How does astrology or our signs play a role in our success as entrepreneurs? What are the kind of things that you you speak to entrepreneurs about who come to you? And I know you work with a lot of them. So, yeah, I love working with entrepreneurs. And also, I, I, there's two ways um, that I will look at when an entrepreneur comes to me. Um, there's two things I want to look at. First is their natal chart. And then often I look at their business chart if they've already launched their business. And if not, sometimes entrepreneurs come to me and to help um, because they need help choosing an ideal launch date that will be the chart of their business and um, like companies like Google Starbucks even the launch of the book Lord of the Rings those three things have amazing birth charts Uh, so Mm. I'm convinced that astrologers were helping to choose those dates Uh, so I think that the chart of the business is huge as well as the entrepreneur's chart. So really, when I work with entrepreneurs, we look at both of those. But first, of course, look at the chart of the entrepreneur. And there's a couple things that I like to start with, uh, which is, you know, first of all, each of us has a specific map of success that looks different for everybody based on where their planets are in the sky and also based on where the elements in their chart are. So in astrology, there's four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, and each represent a different function in running a business. So first, I like to see where the entrepreneur is having a surplus, like where the entrepreneur is very well developed. And then I look at the lacking area, and we really talk about how you can capitalize on what you're good at, and also maybe hire out for the area that we need help in, or else learn it. Um, but I'm a, I'm a real firm believer in getting help in the areas that we're not as proficient in as well. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes that we can support. learn it. A hundred percent. So I first look at the elements, um, fire, earth, air, and water. Um, fire, which is more the personal presence, the experiential quality, earth representing resourcefulness, uh, finances, the day-to-day routine, Air representing ideas, communication, getting the word out through the airwaves. And water is more of the personal contact, the empathy and the connection. Um, so I look at the those four elements first. Um, I like to look at the sun, moon, rising sign. And also just like where the entrepreneur has their luck, where Jupiter is. Mm-hmm. And also where we might put more pressure on ourselves and where the challenges may be, where Saturn is. And then we can learn to manage um, what we have better. It's just about knowing yourself so that you understand your terrain and you can give yourself what you need. Really, astrology is pretty much the study of self-awareness. Now, how long, what is the process when you work with entrepreneurs for reviewing their charts? Is it they make an appointment and you, uh, they give you the information, obviously, make an appointment and you go over everything? Or do you sort of work with them throughout a process? So there's, there's two ways. I mean, first of all, when I do the chart of an entrepreneur or anyone, we look at the natal chart first. We probably spent half the session on that. And then the next half on the year ahead, where we look at patterns of, what's coming up in the weather and how we can make the best out of that opportunity. And also when the challenges are and how to work with them as well. So we're really um, keying the entrepreneurs into the cycles, the natural cycles of their lives Mm -hmm. and how to ride the waves best. Mm -hmm. It's like surfing pretty much. (laughs) So you learn when to get onto the waves, when to get off, uh, when opportunities are coming in, how to show up for them. Also what to avoid. We all have specific challenges We all have pitfalls. We all have these emotional, psychological things and patterns. A lot of this is also bringing the unconscious to consciousness. Um, Many entrepreneurs opt to work with me on a monthly basis. So then we do the like a monthly coaching program. And I do half year, six year programs with that, where, where honestly, the client in that program, the person I work with becomes 
really adept at astrology and good at using it by the end of it. It's like they become their own astrologer too. Right. You start um, to learn more about the things to look for in yourself and in business overall related to astrology, I would imagine. Totally. Uh, I mean, the, like on the basic level, everybody first learns how to work with the lunar cycles, new moons and full moons. That's just kind of like the basic language, how to begin things on new moons and end things culminate on full moons and use the disseminating moon process as letting go of things in your life and lose, use the increasing light of the moon process as building in business. And when you align your business to the natural cycles of sun and moon, you realize that things seem to flow. You're moving with the current gracefully always versus fighting it and working against it. So life just becomes a bit more seamless mm -hmm. and easier. Um, and that's just the surface of it is the lunar cycles. Right. Now, so for anyone listening who might be, say, thinking about launching a business or going into some new venture or adventure, um, is it looking at, what would you say, I should say, as far as looking at the date to do that? Because you mentioned earlier how some of some companies that are so successful, you are convinced that astrologists um, <laughs> played a role in it. So what are we looking for in that perfect day? Mm, well, there's many things I look for. And a lot of businesses just call me to help choose campaign launch dates or business launch dates. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not something you, we could choose on our own. It's something we would need some support with. I would probably, yeah. I mean, I run an astrology school here. And right. usually once people have taken some classes, they're able to uh, choose a date well. But usually they need a pretty clear understanding of natal astrology first before um, getting to choose the right date. So... I look for a lot of things, though. I mean, I, I'd say the hour and the minute matters. Sometimes I tell mm. somebody like 3.37 p.m. You know, it's very exact. <laughs> very specific, right? Exactly. I look at um, the moon is, I want the moon to be enjoining to a friendly aspect or a planet, a benefic, a planet that's going to help the moon. Uh, I look at the rising degree, depending on the business will have different significators. For example, if I'm choosing a marriage date, the moon and Venus placements become very important versus if I'm looking at a business launch, Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter, the business planets and the sun mm. have, have greater hierarchy. So, and then also it will become more nuanced by the nature of the business. Like if it's a fashion brand versus an online school, you know, it would be a totally different chart. So I want the business part chart pretty much to mirror the goals and the mission statement of the company. So I have a long chat with the entrepreneur prior. Right. So I really get a sense of what they want to do with this company. And I try to make the chart mirror all of their main goals. Okay, so we I know we chatted a little bit beforehand about my chart. And for everyone listening, we don't I don't Rebecca didn't give me a full chart because it takes a lot more than um, the few minutes she and I spent together. But can you share a couple of the things you saw based on my birthday for everyone listening, which is February 20th, 1973. And the time 1025 a.m. And what else where I was born, Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So for all of the listeners, those are the three pieces of information that we need to do a birth chart. And I love that you know the exact time. Some people, <laughs> My mom was very clear. That's great. I mean, some people don't. And I would say for the people that are your listeners right now that don't know it, you can always get a birth certificate sent to you just going onto the .gov sites and get it mailed in mm. if you don't have the exact time. Um, so that's, first of all, important before reading. Um so yeah, let's have a look at your chart. Uh, ah! <laughs> so I, I will say, I'm sure you know the fact that you're a Pisces. The sun is in Pisces, right? Mm -hmm. um, you also might like to know that there's 12 houses of the chart and the house that your sun shines out of is the 10th house. The 10th house is known as the house of vocation, the house of fame and honors, the house of career. So not only are you a Pisces sun, but you are the Pisces sun shining out in the most public sector of the whole birth chart. Um, so in other words, you should um, do very well expressing your light, your sun, your radiance in the public sphere. You do very well with the public mm. at large. Um, 
I might like to look at at the rising and the moon sign next. The sun is pretty much uh, what you came here to do. It's the core archetype. So being a Pisces, you are a natural, uh, you have a natural artistry in you and a sense of transcendence to bring spirit into matter and also to help people as well. Probably a humanitarian spirit. Am I right? Yes. Always have um, had that. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. You not only have the sun in Pisces, but Mercury in Pisces too. So there's a lot of pure giving energy in you. Um, and that works through a very grounded Taurus rising, which is sort of like your operating system, which is earthy and grounded. And honestly, it keeps your feet on the ground, that Taurus rising. It's very good, along with your Pisces sun, um, which is the need to have um, great access to the tactile world, which whether it's in food or um, preparing food or garden, um, but being with people, doing things physically as well in the world is also very important for you with the Taurus rising as well. Um, and also having structure. It structures the Pisces sun a lot. Earth and water go very well together. Um, mm. Next thing I see that you have a, a huge amount of air. Remember we talked about the four elements? Right. So air is the element of communication and ideas. So I see that's where you thrive the most is in the area of the intellect and ideas and communication. So I'm not surprised that you are running this podcast because that is your greatest strength. <laughs> now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so the air is where you thrive, communication, sending messages through the airwaves. Um, and not only that, but then I look at your, um, well, also we might want to see what you have less of. Yes. So you have less fire because I like to look at what's what's a little bit more uh, less represented here. What we would need to work on mm -hmm. is the fire energy. So sometimes when there's less fire in the chart, we need to source that from either other people or activities. Um, so getting it's very important to get inspired by other people's creativity as well. And to just be inspired by others can be also being around um, music, dancing, laughter. All of that is so important to build the fire in you. Um, so does and also fire just represent, uh, sorry to interrupt, does fire represent drive or what does fire represent for people listening? Or, or what does it translate? Yeah, so it represents um, the instinct. Yes, drive, creativity, joy where and when some person has less of an element mm -hmm. also the active experiential realm of life um when there's less fire we naturally find other ways to source it um i think also like color therapy is great so when there's less fire having more red around you mm -hmm. like drinking cayenne and ginger more fiery foods creating more fire in the belly maybe breath of fire just bringing more fire into the body as well is important so there's ways to kind of um, modify your life and lifestyle depending on what element you're strong in and what you're missing more. Um, but air likes fire. So when you add fire to the air, that's a great balance. Um, how do you think you bring fire into your life? I don't know. I'm going to think about it even more so now that you mentioned it, especially um, when thinking about color um, foods. I tend to avoid really spicy foods. So maybe I'll spice it up a little bit now that you mentioned that. Um, and you said ginger and cayenne pepper. Mm -hmm. The good idea is to add to it. Yeah, I think, um, well, definitely from the space of enjoying music and, and things like that, um, excite me. So maybe that's the bit of the fire for me. I, I agree that I love to be inspired by other people and keep those people around me. Um, I am a, I consider myself a quiet person, not necessarily shy, but a quiet person, but I enjoy the people around me who have a lot of energy. So maybe that's the way I sort of um, balance it out right now. But I'm going to think about too, just even personal drive. Um, it's something I honestly have been considering for myself, even in business of trying to sort of spark that fire in me to go after some of the things that I truly, truly want to go after. Like building a bigger platform and that kind of thing. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, as you say that, I'm also thinking of um, 
you know, sometimes when we do have less fire, what you're saying to me now is so important to share that with other friends of um, just basically uh, your ideas of building a better platform and how and when you do have less of an element, we tend to attract that in our circle. So I would bet that many of your close friends in your business circle also have perhaps a lot of fire. And mm-hmm. they, and that's what we see in relationships all the time, that our business partners and our, our team members kind of can make up for the elements we're lacking. So even when you're thinking of hiring new team members um, with you, you know, it's great if they naturally do have a lot of fire because they will help you kind of bring that into your business too. Right. Something that balances out what you're beyond just I'm good at this and they're good at that. But really, like you said, looking at how it's compatible from that um, perspective. Exactly. Like, I mean, you have so much air in your chart. I have no air in mine, you know, so I find that I always work with people who have a lot of air because of somewhere where I'm lacking and they help me to get my information out there into the world. Right. <laughs> or I just sit in my room doing astrology charts all day. Good, I'm the air. Not- That's why I came there and said, let's talk, Rebecca. Exactly. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> you know, and it's funny because I have a ton of fire as well. So, mm. you know, this is how we, we balance each other. Mm-hmm. Now, tell us about your book, Your Body and the Stars, and how the Zodiac oh. also affects um, our wellness in addition to our business, because we talked a little bit earlier about self-care, so I think we kind of forget about our personal wellness in that journey. Wait, Elaine, I, I just have to interrupt you once. Before we go into that, can, oh. can we talk about the fact that you have Jupiter in your ninth house, that yes. you have the planet of luck? I just missed one part of your chart that yes, I, would, we can. I think is pretty vital. Um, so do you mind if we rewind, rewind just a second? <laughs> no <laughs> problem. I still have your chart in front of me. Good, I'm excited. I'm just like, I cannot let your listeners go without hearing this. Um, <laughs> because um, two things I look for in the chart, as I was saying, is where we have our luck and also where we have our challenges and shortcomings. And I just have to say that, Elaine, you have your planet of luck, Jupiter, in the ninth house, which is its natural house. Jupiter is a planet of good luck, joy, and expansion. And the ninth house rules broadcasting, publishing, getting information out across the world into the airwaves, media. So when I see the planet of luck, Jupiter, first of all, in the ninth house, which rules broadcasting, publishing, media, airwaves, naturally, if Elaine saw me, if you saw me, you were like 15, I would say, wow, at that point to, to start um, getting your word out there, interviewing people, podcasts, <laughs> video, TV, magazines. This is where you shine. This is where your luck is, uh, naturally. Um, and then I also look at where Saturn is, which is Saturn is in the first house. The first house is the house of self. So I can see you're a really hard worker. And you can also have, um, you can also be critical of yourself. You can also I mean, usually hard workers are some are somewhat, um, but that also helps you um, as well as it can also sometimes maybe you can be a little too hard on yourself, um, but that also brings perfection into what you do. So Saturn shows where we can put a lot of pressure on and Jupiter shows where our luck is. Um, and we really look at the combination and balancing off of first house Saturn and ninth house Jupiter for you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sitting here with a big grin on my face and honestly tears in my eyes too, just hearing what you said about Jupiter and how it's, it just speaks to, well, honestly, what I've been interested in forever. You know, I've been a writer ever since I was a young, since I was, as long as I can remember, I always say even before I knew how to write and then going into magazines, but really I feel like finding my a combination of my purpose and passion right now with doing things like podcasting and creating space for women to share their story. So it sort of feels like it's all coming together now. And then so to hear you say that, hey, this could be the reason for this, or this is the reason for this just makes me it's it feels good to hear that. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think astrology can can be so reaffirming in that way to sometimes these um, inklings we've had about ourselves when we were younger and most we need to really remind it reminds us who we are and also that can give us the confidence to propel onward sometimes in that direction 
So it's it's powerful in that way. It is. I think, too, um, what you said also, even about being a hard worker and to the point sometimes, uh, well, you didn't say this, but I I read or heard becoming obsessive uh, with perfection. So for me, I know I've been working really hard on the podcast and just sometimes people saying it bothers me. People even saying, oh, you should slow down. And I get the intention of where it comes from. And I but there's a part of me that doesn't understand how can I slow down right now? I've got to work and make this work and that kind of thing, even though I want to be aware of that, not pushing too hard, as we talked about. But even hearing you say it sort of clarified for me why that part of myself is there or what what the um, where that comes from and how I can be more conscious of it. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Exactly. It does. Right. Oh, thank that you for sharing good. that. Thank you for sharing that. That <laughs> was good. I mean, those are just two planets. You have an entire sky full of planets. I have so. to make an official appointment to talk to you and go over everything. I would be honored to work yeah. with you. Excellent. <laughs> so now tell us about our um, how our wellness, too, or our, our zodiac signs affect our wellness. Oh, yeah. So I did this collaboration with a doctor, Stephanie Marengo. And we wrote a book published by Simon & Schuster last year. Mm -hmm. It's called Your Body and the Stars. Um, Let me just pick up a copy right now. And this was probably the first book I've ever seen or heard of that where a doctor collaborated with an astrologer, first Mm -hmm. of all. Um, And many of you listeners may may not know that um, the origins of astrology are actually in medicine. Like if you look to the earliest astrology books, they're medical books. Uh, And most people don't expect that. But if you look back to, say, the school of Hippocrates, Hippocrates was an astrologer. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that about him either. And he really, what was um, one of the tenets of his school was that in order to give a proper diagnosis, he said no physician can call himself a physician without a proper knowledge of astrology. So you know, before we had invented the x-ray or even the scalpel, what we were able to understand were things like what sign the moon was in. So exam- for an example, um, people would say, well, the moon is in bar- Mars today. We should not do the bloodletting while the moon is in the sign. Um, I mean, the moon in Aries that rules the blood if the moon was in Aries that day. You know, so astrological, um, so so uh, surgeries and, and things were really based on where the moon was and also the time in which the, the patient fell ill. Doctors would look at this. They would even look at the astrological chart of the patient before a diagnosis. Uh, so two things here. Um, it was a much more holistic worldview back then, right? Before mm-hmm. allopathic Western medicine was created, uh, doctors worked with plant allies a lot, um, herb, herbs, obviously, and lifestyle. So it was pretty like without calling it holistic medicine, you know, right? That was practiced for thousands right. of years, right? So people would work with preventive measures. So, for example. If somebody had a very fiery chart, that would be like hot choleric, hot and dry. Perhaps they would be prescribed daily herbs um, that would really add more lubricant to the body, that would add more moisture in to avoid hot and dry kinds of illnesses that could occur, Um, like overheating and fevers and things like that and migraines. So it was really about balancing the temperaments. And this was medical astrology was practiced for thousands of years. Um, honestly, it just became out of favor in the last couple hundred years, which is nothing but a dot, a speck in time, right? Right. right. If you look at the huge arc, and it really fell out of favor with the with the um, with the advent of. Uh, the age of what I like to call the age of enlightenment, <laughs> the age of enlightenment, <laughs> where the, you know we were kind of cut off than sky. People were like forget, about, forget about the sky, forget about the natural cycles, and allopathic Western medicine, the pharmaceutical industry grew out of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was this real disconnect that happened at one point, and I felt the need to write a book and to with Stephanie 
uh, that would really kind of bring people back into this connection and a book that wasn't just written for astrologers that anybody could understand. Uh, so really it kind of goes back to the origins of astrology. Um, the book is a body scan. We go from head to toe mm -hmm. and she's the doctor, I'm the astrologer, and we're pretty much riffing on the body and what it means on the astrological level, um, psychological, emotional, physical, as each sign, each zodiac sign rules a different part of your body. So uh, we start the book with Aries and we go all the way down to Pisces, the feet. Um, everybody has all the signs that live within them. Even though, Elaine, you're a Pisces, you still have every sign of the zodiac somewhere in your chart. Um, so you can approach the book like, wait, I have a back pain. What's going on with my back? Let me look at the Leo chapter, Back of the Lion. Mm. And there can be lessons that come in the form of back pain that are about your radiance for example and you're shining your light into the world that would be about leo lessons um and then we talk about the whole spectrum of leo the low leo the high leo and different exercises activations and meditations you can do to strengthen any zodiac sign within you so like let's say you have like a big let's say you have to go on the tv the next day for this big interview, um, you might want to do the Aries and the Leo exercises to get ready for that, you know? Um, I'm laughing because those are, you're so in tune. Those were the two signs that I was going to ask you to chat about just because I was picking other signs instead of my own. And you mentioned the exact two signs that I was thinking about, Leo and Aries. <laughs> I swear, I'm not even, I'm just, that's why I'm sitting here quietly like, okay, of course, she knew exactly what I was going to ask about. <laughs> that always it's, happens. It's all these so things. strange. <laughs> okay, I'm not surprised. Um, it's so crazy. So yeah, what would you like to what would you like to talk about first? What, oh, what I just was going to mention as um, just to use as examples in re relation to um, your book. You already have done it. You already did exactly what I was going to ask you. Just um, as examples of those those two signs, um, Aries is the head. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, right. yeah. Let me give you an example of how that would work. Mm -hmm. So, Aries. Each chapter is called something like so. Aries is called head of the ram. Mm -hmm. So we use the animal from each chapter as well. You know, as Taurus is neck of the bull, Gemini's hands of the twins, Cancer's chest of the crab, Leo's heart of the lion. So it goes on like that. Um, but when we're talking about Aries, we're talking about the head. And the theme in this chapter is to assert yourself with active awareness. So Aries is the sign of asserting your individual self into the world. It's a sign of being born. You think of like, when those um, little little shoots have to get through the cold, dry winter soil, that's Aries energy. And they have to be really strong and assertive to get through that soil, you know? So it is a sign of asserting yourself literally headfirst into the world. Um, now, when the Aries in, in you or, or any of our listeners may be unbalanced, we might be experiencing on the physical level migraines, sinus pressure, um, any kind of blockages in the head, or, or the opposite could be like leaky sinuses, you know, and um, just uh, like runny nose as well and things like that. So if the Aries energy is imbalanced, there's a spectrum of, of the imbalance. And we recommend things like neti pot um, and different kinds of exercises, meditations, and affirmations to balance the Aries energy within, mm -hmm. um, whether, whether it's headaches or sinus, sinus issues or anything. Um, and it could be head cold, ear infections, teeth grinding at night. Right. Uh, all of these things, tight jaw muscles, um, eye infections, uh, tooth pain, tooth infections, hair loss. And these are all indicators that, perhaps something else is going on mm -hmm. in your life on the emotional or psychological spiritual level. And this is uh, just kind of a key to where we might need to make some changes and move it. the needle. 
It's great. I'm going to, for everyone listening, of course, I'll have a link to Rebecca's book so you can buy that and check it out. And Rebecca, before you go, I do want to, I want to be conscious of your time, of course, but I do want to talk about the path, my path astrology, your school, which you've had for over a decade now, right? Yes, it's our 11th year right Yay, now. Congratulations. That's amazing. Um, tell our listeners what people give us a sense of what um, students learn when they attend your school. And I know you have new classes beginning October 2017, right? Yes, I do. Thanks. And this year, I'm actually trying something brand new. Uh -huh. So we are running the online school as usual, which is an amazing 12 week program very in-depth and it's for beginner astrologers if you're just starting out you by this 12-week program people will be able to integrate astrology very well into their lives and also give readings for their friends their families and themselves you can pretty much be your own astrologer with this class so there's also um you know supplementary materials it's very in-depth as well so that's the online course um, it's 12 weeks starting in October, and we can link to it later. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just started something new this year, which I'm so psyched about. Uh, because I love hosting so much, I just decided to create another of the school that is basically three retreats, three long weekend retreats. So everything that we learned in the 12 week class online, it would be similar material. But instead, we would be at this beautiful big retreat house upstate. There would be also like hiking, yoga, meditation, gong baths, as well as person, you know, I'll be with everybody hosting astrology classes throughout mm. the days. So we'll be launching, registration will open really soon. And we'll link to the registration page here too. Great. Um, yeah, maybe I'll give a special code for your listeners as oh, well. Oh, that's great. Support is sexy is a great code. Yes, that will be the code. <laughs> Support is sexy. Is it going to be in caps? Uh, sure. That could be okay. Good. Okay. Support is sexy in caps will be the code. Okay. And you'll give, um, you'll let me know the link. I'll include it. Excellent. I said. shall give you that. Sounds yeah. fantastic. Good. That's exciting. So, Rebecca, what would you say that entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Oh, wow. Entrepreneurship is hands down the spiritual practice. I think it's the best spiritual practice being an entrepreneur. Mm. Um, it has told me, it has taught me how to regulate my energy. It has taught me about self care, the importance of self care, and how that so called off time is just as important as our on time. Um, to really value that so much and the spaces in between to ritualize life more, more to slow down. Entrepreneurship has told me that. Um, it's, every day is inspiring. You know, Elaine, every day I learn so much. Right. I, it's the most rewarding thing ever, I feel like, um, because every day a whole new universe opens as I explore an entirely new chart in this work. But overall, I can say entrepreneurship as a whole has been a spiritual practice. I mean, it, it's taught me about energy. It's taught me about downtime and what I need to thrive. So in closing, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Okay, Elaine, hands down, that would be Susan Miller, my mentor. Um, she has really um, basically brought the astrologer out within me and made me realize that it's possible. And she pushed me beyond my comfort zone constantly, pushed me to my edge almost every week when I was learning with her. Um, and that was amazing to be pushed so hard. Um, and I... She stretched me because I think she knew I could handle it, too, to a certain extent. Even when I couldn't, I figured it out, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, every time I teach, every time I give a workshop, I, I thank my mentors. I thank my stepmother, who really showed me the world of astrology, and who Susan Miller, who is more of a business mentor for me and an entrepreneurship mentor as well. I mean, both of them really equally uh, have just kind of, 
I give gratitude almost every day for these two women. One of the beautiful things I think you said in that, all of it is beautiful, but just the idea of her stretching you too. We all need that person around us who can either gently or sometimes give us that nudge we need to stretch. Absolutely. And I feel like we don't sometimes, um, we don't challenge each other enough. I think that's Mm -hmm. so important. And that's something she taught me is to push my entrepreneur colleagues and to challenge them more, to push them to their edges and see, because that helps, you know, we help each other. And to not make everything sound easy, you right, know, it you know <laughs> it's not. And people talk about these seven figure things and all of that and how easy it is. It's not like this is not all easy. We have to be real with each other and and help each other out in the struggles, because whatever one of our entrepreneur colleagues is going through, likely some, one of us has already gone through the ropes there. Right. And we have some roadmaps that we can share. We have to communicate and connect more. I'm a huge proponent of like keeping the communities connected and tight. Absolutely. So now tell us how we can support you. We mentioned some of the links we'll have to the book, the registration for the retreat, but tell everyone where they can find you, uh, your website and any social media or things you want us to know about. Oh, thanks. Um, so I do personal readings um, quite often. And if you're interested in that or the school or events, classes, the website is mypathastrology.com. And if you scroll down, you can sign up for my newsletter, which I send monthly, not too often, don't worry. Mm-hmm. So again, it's M-Y-P-A-T-H astrology.com. Uh, where I have the newsletter, all sorts of events and blogs, blog articles as well. Um and also the Twitter, the Facebook, and Instagram, it's all the same, My Path Astrology. So it's pretty easy to find, um, you know, it's one word in, um, in all of that, My Path Astrology. I think it's on the Facebook, it's three words, but in, in the Twitter and Instagram, one word, My Path Astrology. Um, and yeah, if you follow me there, you'll see my more like weekly postings about the cosmic weather, what's going on in the sky and how it can relate to our lives and really how you can use astrology to help you and optimize your life and opportunities on a daily basis. Because really tuning into the sky is our birthright. Excellent. Rebecca, you're fantastic. This is I just am so happy that we're connected. Thank you so much for your insight and your wisdom and for that reading. Oh, Elaine, I love talking with you. I hope we we can do this again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? The earth needs you to be you. We are all born for a reason. And I feel like our purpose here is to tune into that reason and simply be you. Uncover what that is and shine your light to the world. Excellent. Rebecca, hold on just a second. All right. So thank you so much for listening to that conversation with Rebecca. I hope you were inspired by that. Be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can find out more about Rebecca, about the services that she offers, about her astrology school, also so that you can get the discount that she mentioned in this episode. So hopefully you listen through the whole thing. She has a special discount just for Support Is Sexy listeners. Thank you, Rebecca. So make sure again, you go to supportissexypodcast.com go to the search icon at the top and just type in Rebecca R-E-B-E-C-C-A and her show notes page will pop up with all of the information and all of the links there including links to the books and the people that she mentioned in this episode that you definitely want to find out more about if you have any interest in astrology especially also before you go I want to make sure that you know about the support is sexy mastermind if you go to support is sexy mastermind.com you can find out more information but as Rebecca and I talk about in this episode and you know I talk about all the time having it all does doesn't mean doing it all alone. You need support. You need women or people around you who support you, who have your back, who are all about you and your vision, who encourage you to ask for and accept support, not just be in a group, hang around, tell what you're doing, 
What do you need support with? What do you need help with? Did you even start your business yet? Are you in the idea phase? Do you need to brainstorm about that? SupportIsSexyMastermind.com is the space to go to to consider. And I always say, you don't have to join there, but I want you to see what's possible. And if not in this group, in some other kind of group, whether it's a mastermind or a group of your friends or someone else or something else that is there to support you in your journey. None of us have to be superwoman. None of us have to be Wonder Woman. We get to get support. Or even if we choose to be those people, Wonder Woman, Superwoman, you still get to have support. So go to supportissexymastermind.com. Watch the video there. I tell you a little bit more about it, about where the whole Support is Sexy idea came from. And then I outline what we're offering in the mastermind that you can be a part of. A great group of women from all around the world, hundreds of women together, supporting each other, moving each other and our businesses and ideas forward. So that's supportissexymastermind.com. All right, so thank you all so much for listening. You know I appreciate you. And now, until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.